Okay, so part three on our um, study on prayer, looking through Ephesians 3. And uh, this one is about prayer being about asking. Paul goes on to say that prayer is asking. He's going to make a request. So it's okay to make requests to God. The Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, uh, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's Philippians 4, 6. And then in Ephesians 3, 16 to 17, which is where we're at, he says, I pray or I ask that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So here's the big idea. God is independent. He doesn't need anyone or anything. We are dependent and we need God for everything. And here's the other big idea that God doesn't need us. Instead, he wants us and he loves us. That's even better. It's like a family that adopt a child. They don't need the child. They want the child. They want to love the child, protect the child, bring him into a family. And that's the f God that we've got. God's a father like that. And so God isn't looking to take from us, doesn't need us, doesn't need anything from us. God's looking to give to us because we need. And so we bring our requests to him and we ask him for help because we're dependent on him. It's not the other way around, which is why Jesus says part of praying is we pray for food. We pray for daily bread. We pray for, we pray for, for, for God to provide. And here Paul is praying for the church that they would have the power of the Holy Spirit working in them and through them. And he prays and he asks that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. See, what Paul is praying for here is a much, much bigger prayer. Probably one of the biggest prayers we could ever pray. Even though we've probably prayed a lot of prayers that we feel are big prayers to God. But here Paul is praying for something so significant that it's life changing for us to continue to pray, to continue to know God and to encounter God in a way that is to be experienced. And interesting through the church meeting, uh, Rachel Pons talked about, about the psalm where it talks about the house of God. And here we see language that Paul is using when he's saying about Christ dwelling in us actually speaks of a home. It's talking about a dwelling, a dwelling place, a place, a home, a permanent settlement, not Christ dwelling as a casual visitor. It's not as Christians, we're looking for a passing touch from the Lord. You know, as he wanders on by one day, oh, just come and touch me, Lord. And the few days later, oh, yeah, well, I just pray you touch me again. No, here Paul is bringing a revelation that we need to understand where he's, where God is desiring to make his home in us by dwelling there permanently. As you know, there's a difference between a hotel and a home. Big, big difference. I don't know if any of you, I, I mean, I don't know, there might be some someone out there, but uh, how many of you checked into a hotel and thought, well, I've got to go to B&Q because I'm, I'm going to have to paint this wall. I mean, the wall might need painted. But the reality is you don't sit there going, right, I'm going to go to B&Q, I'm going to get the paint, I'm going to get the brushes, get the rollers, and I'm going to paint this wall. And while I'm at it, I'm going to change the blinds and actually the sink's dripping. So I'm going to have to get some tools and fix that leak. And while we're at it, the carpet's very dirty. So I think I'll, I'm going to clean it. And uh, if that doesn't work, then I'll buy a new carpet. Anyone ever done that? Uh, you'd be crazy if you did. <laughs> but why don't we do that at a hotel? Well, the answer is simple. It's because we're not going to stay there. It's not our home. Now, what happens when you do buy a home? For those of you who have bought one or rent one and you've got permission to do stuff to it, you start working on it. You keep working on it. We're going to paint this room. We're going to paint that room. And all of a sudden you're like, well, it kind of makes the hallway look ugly now we've painted. So we're going to need to paint the hallway and we're going to need to paint the cabinets. And well, actually the carpet looks grotty now. So we will change the carpet. And you're like, Oh, now we're going to change the lights and we're going to change this and we're going to change that. And in reality, you get a house, once it starts, you just don't stop. You're going to be working on it because it's your home. 
and over, over time you're going to keep working on it because it's where you're going to dwell in it you know where you're going to live in it because it's going to be your home to you and what Paul's praying is that God's people would understand that Jesus does not want to live in us like a hotel but a home he doesn't just want to check in be with us for a couple of hours and then move on he doesn't want you to live your life independently and separately from him and then just invite him like oh Jesus I've really messed up could you come and hang out with me for a couple of days claim my mess up sort me out could you move into my life and then move out so I can uh, get back on with what I want to do it's not how God works it's not how God wants to work it's not how God intends for us to know him what Paul is saying here in these verses is that Christ dwells in us Jesus dwells in us through the person and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit and what God wants our life to be is his home where is house the church becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit the house of God there's no physical temple anymore God's not concerned about buildings brick buildings I've said it before but you know brick buildings without the church in it and a pointless because God is using and filling people to make us as living stones and what's interesting is like you know the, from the psalm that Rachel read was about you know the attractiveness of the house and you read in Revelation about the great shiny gems and stones and this that and the other and you know we might look at ourselves and think no no God's got something much much better planned for the world than putting a bunch of people like us together as living stones but he doesn't God's intention first of all through his son being filled with the Holy Spirit becoming the temple of the Holy Spirit as the starting point when his disciples were were like admiring the great temple of Jerusalem going wow this is amazing isn't this amazing Jesus and he's like Do you know what that'll just get destroyed but three days later it will rise again where she's talking about himself as the temple of the Holy Spirit then the temple of the Holy Spirit being the church and so we need to understand or try to get to some understanding that that God loves us so much that he's prepared to live and dwell permanently in us as his house as his home on earth ask the question where does God live right now he lives in each one of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior where is home and he wants to move in our lives and he's going to start working it now you may pick an area of your life to work on first and then when he's done with that he's going to move on into another room of our lives and then he's going to be again on another project moving a sofa here moving a so you know moving a chair there lifting up some of the floorboards he might need to move a chair before he can lift up the carpet and the floorboards and and therefore he works in us intricately and perfectly and graciously and and, and kindly as well Jesus through the Holy Spirit when he dwells when he stays when he resides at the center of our being he's doing a, re a renovation project on every aspect of our life he's doing it to make us holy the Bible says or in other words to make us more like Jesus Galatians 2 says I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, becoming a Christian is crucifying our lives with Christ and no, no longer living to, to kind of gratify our selfish, our, our selfish, uh, yeah, selfish desires or living according to the flesh or living like the world, as, as Scripture says. I no longer live but Christ now lives in me and in becoming a Christian we need to understand that when we give our lives to Christ we're giving him permission to reside in us personally and to do his work in us excuse me to do his work in us and every time you're working on your house friends family every time you're doing a project every time you're cleaning fixing something painting something you're mending something rearranging something I want you to think of this verse Jesus wants to do the same thing in my life that I'm doing in my house right now. He wants to make it a better home for the Holy Spirit. It's not just that we're working on our homes. It's that we're, well, sorry, it's not just that we're working on our homes. It's 
that were the home of the Holy Spirit. And he's always got a project he's working on in us. Guys, I don't want you to see this as a discouragement. And some people see this as a discouragement. They're like, okay, well, we dealt with this. And then and then I thought, well, finally I got through it. And then, oh, then Jesus showed me this. And now I've got a whole new thing to deal with. An old new project he's doing in me. But guys, he's doing it because he loves us. Hebrews says that, you know, he disciplines those he loves. He disciplines his sons. Discipline, again, is a, is a word that needs to be defined, but it's, it's, it's a father looking at his son who's maybe going off in the wrong direction. He wants to bring him back on the straight and narrow. He might be, he's off doing his own thing as God's son. And he's like, no, no, I want you back. Don't, don't go, don't get liberal. Don't go into license. Don't sin and think and cheapen grace. No, come back to the walk of grace where let me work in you. Now there is it. Let's get all legalistic and judgmental and bitter and twisted. No, no, come back again. Help me. I want to help you as a father to walk the road of grace again, where I can dwell in you, work in you, make me more like Jesus. So don't get discouraged by this. It's because he loves you and he wants the whole home to belong to him. He wants all of us to belong to him. And he wants your whole life to be a good place for you and he to dwell together as friends. Have you ever noticed Jesus working on an issue with you? I mean, I'd hope that'd be the case. Uh, I can just tell you over the years and years and continued uh, days that God is working through issues in me. And I know with it should be the case for all of us. And when you think that you get through something, there's another thing that you've got to deal with, yeah? You know that issue has always been there in your life and Jesus simply hasn't started working it until now because he's been working on other things prior to this. And this was so important that you weren't ready for it yet, but you are now. You weren't ready for floorboards to be lifted to uncover maybe deep hurts and pains. Instead, he needed to move the furniture around a bit where you got to think, oh yeah, this looks good. Jesus is at work in me. And he's not, he's not trying to like trick you or uh, in any way. But what he moves around and what he starts with is down to his understanding of us. He knows us inside out. He knows what we've gone through. So we need to trust him that as he's moving this, this, that, and the other, that actually at some point, some floorboards might have to be lifted. where you can work through what you need to work through with him. But it's always been there and it's his decision and his timing. His time is perfect. When he starts, what he finishes. So we should be really encouraged by this. And so Paul is praying and he's asking. I'm praying and I'm asking that you would welcome Jesus into your heart. Welcome Jesus as the centre of your being. Through faith, trust him. That's what it means to trust in Jesus to take residence, permanent residence in our lives. That the power of the Holy Spirit will continue, continue to be showing you areas and ways that we can become more like him. And that should be our heart's desire to be made more like Jesus. That's what he's doing in us. We should be encouraged by what God Jesus is doing in us. And that's what should be part of our praying individually, but as a church family as well. We should be asking, Lord Jesus, come and make us more like your son. And if we pray it, make me like Jesus, then we've got to expect the Holy Spirit to start work. And to do just that. And yes, sometimes the things that God does in us are painful. Sometimes they're difficult to get through. But this is where we've got to trust him. He's living and dwelling in us. He's made his home in us. And we need to trust him. Unfortunately, so many people think the church is an old building needing lots of work done on it. Some are closed, derelict, der uh, derelict abandoned. Some turned into nightclubs, whatever. Point is, people should be seeing the church as us, God's people, being made new. And not ruins of despair, even though we are ruins, we're not ruins of despair, we're ruins of restoration. God's restoring us to be his glorious church. 
That doesn't mean we don't share our struggles and our challenges. But some, if not all, challenges are an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. So that we, as Paul says, to him be the glory through the church forever and ever. Amen. Guys, this isn't through the church building be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. It's through his living stones. It's through us, Lord Jesus, make us more like you, like you so that you get the glory, so that people see that, yes, we're not perfect. Yeah, we might be ruined, but we're people of grace, being shaped by Jesus, being shaped by the Holy Spirit. We get to choose whether we're going to work with God on, on our hearts or we're going to stay derelict and close to him. And we need to understand that the end of this, so that towards the end of this prayer, Paul's saying, no, it's to, to him be the glory through this. God wants to work in us, not keep us ruined, not keep us as derelict sinners, but to, to draw us into sonship where he lifts us up. And, and guess what? We get to shine out the brightness of Christ. This is where shining out like stars, as it says in Philippians, comes from by Jesus making us more like him. Because we're his and we belong to him. And when we need to trust him, we need to work with him. We need to allow him room, allow him per permission to take a wall down or two. And this is what Paul is praying for. This is what he's asking for. This is what I'm praying and asking for myself, for us as a church, that we be renewed and restored in the love of God, being anchored on firm foundations during this life through its ups and downs so that God gets the glory that God shines brighter gets the attention and surely as sons of God we want to reflect the sun so that more sons are won into the kingdom we need to capture the vision of the church that it's through the family of God those without God get to see God through what God is doing in us what's and all we can be honest about our failings but we can share that the utter dependency upon the grace of God and let people see this changing from one degree of glory to the next. It's a process, it's a journey, but one that God is committed to, to do in us and through us. So let's be praying for this.